Chapter One of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Fletcher, 2017. Miss Philura's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley. Chapter One. As on a memorable occasion in her not distant past, Miss Philura Rice leaned forward and gazed at the reflection of herself which looked back at her from out the somewhat dim and clouded surface of the mirror atop her shabby little bureau. The mirror in question was cracked diagonally across its surface, the fact being hinted at by the blue ribbon pinned over the crack. Now, it is a custom quite as old as the race itself to gaze at one's reflection in the looking-glass. Everyone does it generally in private, in the solitude of one's own dressing-room, but sometimes in public, catching unexpected and often disconcerting views of one's face and person in some cunningly placed mirror. For example, Jones, dining at a downtown restaurant, catches sight of a fellow eating at a table near him. Oh, what a disagreeable-looking chap, cogitates Jones. Well, I don't like his nose nor his eyebrows, nor the set of his coat, nor the way he uses his knife and fork. Then it suddenly dawns on Jones that the whole side of the restaurant is one huge mirror, and that he has been gazing at himself, Jones, and that he doesn't in the least like the look of Jones. He tries to comfort himself by the reflection that, after all, it wasn't any sort of a looking-glass not to be compared with the shaving-glass on his own dresser at home, with which morning presentment of himself he is complacently familiar. But somewhere in the back of his brain lurks the conviction that for once at least he has beheld himself as others see him, and that Jones is a commonplace, not to say disagreeable-looking fellow. But all this is quite beside the mark, when one comes to the consideration of Miss Philura's inspection of her small person in the cracked mirror of her own little bedroom. Miss Philura's earnest blue eyes were not concerning themselves with the faint lines about her delicate lips, nor even with the vague mist of silver glinting the brown hair about her ears. No, quite frankly and unaffectedly, the lady was studying the effect of her dress, a world too large for her. The material was good, there could be no question as to that. It was a satin brocade, exhibiting large, sprawling leaves of black on a purple background. It was rich and lustrous, and the unfashionable skirt swept in billowy folds about the slender figure, which continued to twist and turn from side to side before the cracked mirror. The crack curiously interrupted and diversified the view, so that Miss Philura saw, as it were, her small person in sections, like an imperfectly constructed picture puzzle. But when one has used an article, however imperfect, for a matter of thirty years, one learns to make allowances. Nevertheless, and also notwithstanding, Miss Philura presently divested herself of the black and purple gown with a pensive sigh. If only it wasn't black and purple, she murmured, and if the leaves weren't so large and creepy. Miss Philura sighed a second time, as she took from the table a violet-tinted sheet of note-paper, exhaling the odour of violets, both colour and perfume being particularly affected by the writer of the words scrawled in loose, fashionable characters across the page. My dear Philura, she read for the second time, I own that I was exceedingly surprised, I might almost say shocked, to learn of your contemplated marriage to the Reverend Mr. Pettibone. Had you seen fit to consult me before taking so serious a step, I should have advised strongly against it. Your life, past as it has been amid humble surroundings, 
and with the very limited means of culture and improvement i have been able to afford you from time to time during your brief stays at my home in boston have hardly fitted you in my opinion for the very grave responsibilities you appear so eager to assume let me implore you before it is too late to withdraw from the false position in which you find yourself at your time of life dear flora there can be no romantic ideas concerning love and marriage which sometimes serve as an excuse for more youthful follies should you however ignore my advice as i fear you will incur the very grave risk attendant upon marriage with an elderly widower as i understand mr pettibone to be with your eyes open i am sending you with this an outworn gown of my own which should you persist in rushing in where angels fear to tread will make over into a suitable dress for the occasion of the marriage this missive which miss philura perused with a faint frown between her childish brows was signed i am my dear philura most sincerely yours caroline p van duser the time had been and that not so long since when miss philura would have been utterly annihilated crushed beaten and routed from any position whatsoever by such a letter signed with the authoritative name caroline p van duser now she folded the sheet with brisk motions of her roughened finger-tips returned it to its envelope with a little laugh then still brisk and smiling she hung the rustling brocade away in her closet on the way downstairs she even hummed a verse of an ancient hymn which had clung to her memory ever since a memorable sunday marking the beginning of the marvellous new experience which had blossomed in the bleak and barren waste of her existence god's purposes will ripen fast unfolding every hour the bud may have a bitter taste but sweet will be the flower she sang under her breath miss philura's blue eyes were very bright her thin cheeks very pink as she proceeded to set her tiny rooms in the perfection of cleanliness and order which reminded one of the interior of a wave-washed shell or the heart of a morning glory newly opened to the sun it was a shabby little house within and without but the ancient furniture reflected the bright light of the november day in polished surfaces and even the worn rag-rugs on the floor exhibited rich and subtle blendings of colour not unlike those of an eastern prayer rug when all was finished miss philura washed her hands and dried them carefully on the roller towel behind the kitchen door then she sat down by the window and glanced shyly out between the green leaves of the newly potted geraniums the trees were swept bare of leaves in the gales of early november so that one could see clearly silhouetted against the dazzling blue of the sky the slender steeple of the presbyterian church next to the church half hid in sombre evergreens was the parsonage miss philura blushed delicately as she gazed her thin hands clasped with the rapture of her thoughts only six months and what changes had come over her life she must needs pity the miss philura of that unthinkable time when nobody loved her and she had faced a dreary vista of days monotonously alike beginning with half-hearted prayers to what she fancied a cold-hearted critical judge seated aloft in a distant heaven all gold and glittering gems then had come the revelation and after all it had come about through cousin caroline van duser miss philura recalled for the thousandth time the day she had made herself ready to accompany mrs van duser to the ontological club in boston she pictured with positive relish her shrinking self seated meekly opposite the magnificent person of mrs j mortimer van duser wearing the ill-fitted dress of black alpaca and the obsolete bonnet tied primly under her chin and my hair she murmured addressing her maltese cat 
who was watching her with a reflective gleam in his jewel-like eyes. "'Do you remember, Mortimer, how I used to fix my hair?' The name of Miss Philura's cat marked her one previous ebullition of what she had sadly recognised as that phase of character known in theological circles as unregenerate human nature. But the cat had so resembled the husband of Mrs. J. Mortimer Van Duser, with his cold, calculating eyes, his feline neatness of person, his well-tended whiskers, and the terrifying gaze he was wont to bestow upon her small self, when at infrequent intervals she appeared at his hospitable board. The inevitable meeting with that awe-inspiring millionaire, who had the honour of calling Mrs. Caroline Van Duser his wife, was almost enough to deter one from seeking light and culture in the undeniable centre of all light and culture. Mr. J. Mortimer Van Duser never appeared to remember her from one visit to the next, and merely growled, like a cat over a mouse, Miss Philura could not help thinking, when Mrs. Van Duser drew his inscrutable gaze upon herself, with majestic words, "'You will remember my third cousin, Philura Rice, Mortimer. I felt it was my duty to afford Philura the opportunity of attending the course of lectures on the proper attitude of the masses to the classes, which, owing to other engagements, I am unable to attend.' So she had called her grey kitten Mortimer, in a spirit of uncharitable reprisal, which made her positively afraid to say her prayers for two whole days. As for Mortimer, he had grown into a stately, dignified personage of a cat, whose green eyes frequently assumed the veritable expression of the Boston millionaire, and Miss Philura continued to call him Mortimer, as has been stated. If Mortimer remembered how Miss Philura used to arrange her hair, he made no response. Instead, he yawned discreetly, his pink tongue curling back between his cruel, sharp-pointed teeth like a leaf. "'I was a fright, Morty, dear,' quoth Miss Philura, waxing familiar and affectionate. "'I am sure he never would have thought of, of loving me, with my hair combed back tight and done up in a hard knot.' Mortimer turned his back upon his mistress and wound himself into a graceful coil of grey fur, breathing selfish comfort. His opinion on the subject of Miss Philura's coiffure he kept to himself. "'If I hadn't found out,' pursued Miss Philura, her wistful eyes on the parsonage roof, which peeped at her through a pair of dormer windows, about the encircling good, I should never... Oh, she broke off with a little laugh. And here I am worrying, actually worrying about my wedding dress. A brisk jingle of the feeble doorbell interrupted the little lady's further cogitations. She hurried to answer it, a becoming colour in her cheeks. One could never tell when Mr. Pettibone, she hadn't been able yet to bring herself to call him Silas, might call. But it wasn't the minister's tall figure which confronted her on the doorstep, but a woman, clad in a heavy woollen shawl. She wore coarse blue mittens like those of a man, and a wing of snowy hair folded her rough red cheeks on either side. Miss Philura's colour faded a little as her eyes fell upon the quaint figure. "'Good morning, Hulda,' she said. "'Here's your butter, miss,' said the woman thrusting a small package into Miss Philura's unwilling hand. Her black eyes snapped, and she nodded her head vigorously. It's good enough for Queen Victory if she was living to eat it, and so I guess it's good enough for you. Oh, but, Hulda, quavered Miss Philura, I know it's good. I never found fault with the butter. Miss Philura bethought herself that she was going to marry the minister, and drew herself up with gracious dignity as she added, "'Your butter, Hulda, is excellent, excellent. "'But I have thought it best for my health "'to refrain from eating butter for the present.' "'The butter woman fixed her bright, bird-like eyes upon Miss Philura. "'Butter's fattening,' she said at last. 
fattening echoed miss philura weakly yes i suppose it is you ought to eat it pursued the butter woman you ought to eat a good and plenty of it three times a day she nodded at miss philura as if to defy her to prove the contrary a delicate colour fluttered in miss philura's cheeks then you think she murmured they like em fat said the butter woman still defiant don't i know em they like em round and plump and soft and smooth i don't think i understand you Hulda," said miss philura very dignified indeed though still gracious ministers ain't no different from other men as i know of insisted the butter woman she waved her hand conclusively you ain't no fatter than that poker ma'am it's quite fashionable to be slender Hulda," said miss philura almost piteously she gazed sideways at the poker standing stiffly beside the fireless grate its brazen head reflecting the light in its polished surface i should dislike to be really fat you know the butter woman stood up with the air of one who has finished argument and downed a dispute she drew from under her shawl a basket and from the basket she produced and laid upon the table each with a defiant thump a plump chicken a roll of butter and a dozen eggs in a paper bag now these ere things she said in a tone which brooked no denial i want you should eat don't you go to carrying broth to nobody nor yet the eggs nor yet the butter but hold her oh they look very nice but don't i know you're getting ready to be married and of course you don't think of nothing else morning noon and night i can't give you no silver spoons for a wedding present though land knows i'd like to with your ma buying butter and me for a matter of ten years steady and you never missing your half pound a week since she was laid away eight years come april so if you'll take a pound or two from me it ought to be five at the very least for a wedding present why miss philura's blue eyes filled with sudden tears oh how kind and good of you to have thought of it Hulda. thank you a thousand times she took the butter woman's toil-hardened hand in both her own and squeezed it gratefully there there ain't nothing with me churning twice in the week and chickens fairly underfoot i'm coming again a week from today and i want to see you a mite heavier than you be now she felt miss philura's fragile little arm with an experienced thumb and finger and eyed her appraisingly a matter of ten pounds wouldn't do no harm she murmured well my advice to you is lay abed mornings and eat as hearty as you can land i'd fatten you if i'd just have you under my eye for a while she pinned her shawl together with an energetic stab of a black-headed pin hm, when's the wedding she demanded gruffly why we hope we expect it will be on thanksgiving day faltered miss philura trembling visibly in view of the near approach of her great happiness the butter woman stared past the blushing wistful face on thanksgiving day she muttered on thanksgiving day perhaps you think it an odd day to be married on miss philura's gentle voice went on but mr pettibone's congregation seemed to think that they ought all to be invited to the wedding we should have liked it to be very quiet but there was some feeling mr pettibone says so we thought as the church would have to be opened and warmed on thanksgiving day for the regular services you know why it might be as well to take advantage the butter woman did not appear to be listening she fetched a great sigh and shook her broad shoulders ah well she said there's no use to be harking back to what's past and gone but it's hard not to be doing it when the summer's over and gone and naught remains but dead leaves blowing hither and yon the cold weather seems to be setting in early this year offered miss philura vaguely her thoughts had reverted once more to the purple and black brocade hanging in her wardrobe upstairs the butter woman was looking at her keenly 
her mouth puckered into a half smile whatever you do she said briskly lay a bed and eat eat hearty betwixt now and thanksgiving day there ain't nothing he'll like so well miss philura looked puzzled you mean she began the butter woman nodded her bright eyes half hid in wrinkles of mirth there ain't a man livin as likes to marry a livin skeleton nor yet a bag of bones they like em nice and fat with which she darted down the steps climbed into her wagon and drove away before miss philura had done blushing end of chapter one Chapter Two of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. All the world is said to love a lover, but there are ifs and buts, and sundry exceptions to this as to every other sweeping statement of a more or less general truth. For example, Miss Electa Pratt, engaged in wringing out her dishcloth with hard twists of her bony fingers felt no soft emotions of affection welling up in her virgin bosom as she caught sight of philura rice hurrying past the house her small figure bent against the roaring wind that swept the fallen leaves into miniature whirlpools and lashed the leafless branches overhead miss philura was clutching at her hat brim with one shabbily gloved hand and it was this fact simple and natural as it was which brought miss pratt into the maternal presence placidly engaged in knitting out of blue wool what she was pleased to term a fascinator the fascinator in question was intended for the sole use of Electa, but the fact did not soften the asperity of that lady's tones as she said if there ain't philura rice a hanging on to that hat of hern for dear life you don't say electy observed mrs pratt to the busy tune of her needles well now i guess the wind's a-blowing some this morning ain't it i've been listening to it roaring down the chimbley it reminds me of the day your pa passed away mrs pratt was considered perversely charitable by her daughter who was in the habit of telling everybody that ma was failing right along and that since her last annual attack of grief she wasn't quite right in her mind i'd laugh if those feathers of hers got carried away said mr lecter vindictively it would serve her right forgetting the minister away from you i suppose said the old lady but land i don't think he'd a thought of such a thing as marrying you electy there you go again ma cried miss pratt justly incensed how many times have i got to tell you that i wouldn't marry silas pettibone not if he was the last man on earth now you hear me ma pratt and don't you dast say anything like that miss puffer if she runs in or to anybody else the idea mrs pratt was counting stitches knit ten purl five she murmured did you say you was going down to the post office daughter to get the best idea uh, yes ma replied miss electa aware of the value of a change of thought if miss puffer or miss buckthorn come in tell him i won't be gone ten minutes i'll bring you some peppermints if you she had almost said if you'll be good but a glance into the meek softly wrinkled old face deterred her somehow <sighs> mother's awful contrary lately she cogitated as she hurried down the street bent upon overtaking the wind-swept figure of miss philura oh, she's going to the store said miss pratt under her breath and she hurried faster than before just why she so strongly desired to see with her own eyes what philura rice was about to purchase at george trimmer's dry goods emporium doubtless with a view to her approaching marriage Electa pratt could not possibly have told but the desire was there and it urged her on however she was doomed to disappointment 
Miss Philura emerged from the shop just as her friend Miss Pratt came abreast of it, serene and smiling, and carrying in one hand a small, a very small parcel. Good morning, Elector, was Miss Philura's greeting, but she seemed disposed to hurry away in the opposite direction. Miss Pratt linked herself to the bride-elect with prompt decision. My, I haven't seen you for an age, she began. I've been over to your house twice lately, when I was most sure you was home, and rang and rang. Miss Philura blushed guiltily. On one of those occasions, she and Mr. Pettibone had been snugly ensconced behind the geraniums in her little parlour, and Mr. Pettibone had, she blushed a deeper pink to think of it, merely tightened the clasp of his arm about her waist and remarked, It's Elector Pratt. We don't want to see her. Let her ring. It had seemed almost irreligious to Miss Fuliora. Never in her life had she dared to disobey that peremptory summons. But she had sat quite still while the bell jangled spitefully under Elector's determined hand. I was most sure I saw the minister go into your house not ten minutes before, went on Miss Pratt. I was over to Miss Buckthorn's and we both saw him. Mm, murmured Miss Fuliora. Oh, perhaps, perhaps my doorbell. You needn't bother to tell another lie to me, Fuliora Rice, intoned Miss Pratt. Another? What do you mean, Elector? I never said one word about it to you before, said Miss Pratt firmly, but I'm going to now. Do you remember telling me you was engaged to be married last spring? just after you came back from visiting your relations in Boston? Miss Fuliora drew a deep sigh. I would rather not talk about it, Elector. I... you wouldn't understand. Oh, wouldn't I? retorted Miss Pratt. Well, I can try, anyhow. We was coming out of church. It was the Sunday you first come out in that new suit of yours and that hat with feathers. I shouldn't think you'd want to wear em out in a wind like this. They look all frazzled out. Miss Fuliora straightened herself. If these feathers are spoiled, I can have others, she said. Miss Pratt cackled derision. <laughs> That's just the way you talk before, she said. I says to you, everybody says you've had money left to you and that you're going to get married i says and you says i've got all the money i need you says and i'm engaged to be married miss fuliora's blue eyes gazed almost defiantly into elector pratt's green ones well she said i know i said it it was true every word true a singular radiance overspread her delicate face, transfiguring it for a moment into beauty. Do you mean to tell me you was engaged to be married to Mr. Pettibone when you said that to me, Philura Rice? Be careful. You went to see Mr. Pettibone afterward and told him what I said, returned Miss Philura unexpectedly, and he, he said it wasn't so. Miss Pratt threw up her chin aggressively. And what's more, your cousin Van Duser said it wasn't so. She said you didn't have any money left you and that you weren't going to be married. So there. Miss Fuliora pondered, her eyes upon the small paper parcel in her hand. Then she turned suddenly, almost breathlessly upon the spinster, whose attitude and expression reminded her irresistibly of Mortimer's at the moment of pouncing upon an unlucky mouse. Elector, she said tremulously, you aren't very happy, are you? Happy? echoed Miss Pratt. Happy? Me? I'd like to know what that's got to do with your telling me... It's got everything to do with it, said Miss Fuliora. If you'd only understand... But I'm afraid you wouldn't, even if I... That's the second time you've said that, 
remarked Miss Pratt acidly. When it comes to understanding, I guess I'm pretty near as smart as some other folks I could mention. Oh, I know I'm not clever at all, Electa. I didn't mean that. Well, what did you mean? I'd really like to hear what you've got to say for yourself. And I ain't the only one you'll find. There's plenty of folks that's as much in the darks as I be. The cat-like gleam in Miss Pratt's eyes was lost on Miss Flora, who was wondering if she ought to lay bare the wonderful secret which she bore about enshrined in her inmost heart like a jewel of price. After all, was not Electa like her lonely, unhappy self of half a year ago? And had she any right to withhold the certainty of happiness from Electa? Miss Pratt licked her lip. Don't hesitate to speak right out, Philura, she said acidly. How anybody would dare to say they was engaged before the man proposed is what beats me. Miss Philura was gazing at her parcel. It was because, because he was in the encircling good, Elector. I knew I was going to be married because I believed. But I didn't, I didn't know... Miss Pratt stared. He was in the what? she demanded. What in the world are you talking about? <laughs> Miss Fleura experienced a wild desire to run away. Some other time, Electa, she murmured. If you could only hear Mrs. Smart lecture, you might do that, you know. I, I can't explain. If you don't want me to think you're raving crazy, Philura Rice, you'll explain, as you call it, this minute. Miss Philura turned her face away from her inquisitor. It appeared more and more impossible to tell Elector Pratt about the all-encircling good. And yet, it was her duty. She had been brought face to face with it. She was almost ashamed to remember at that moment a verse about pearls and swine. You are not... One acquires the habit of thinking aloud during years of solitude. She had almost said, You are not a swine, Elector. I'm nobody's fool, if that's what you mean, Philora, Miss Pratt observed appositely. I know you're not, Elector, Miss Philura agreed eagerly, and then she gathered courage. When I was in Boston, I went with cousin Caroline Van Duser to hear a lecture at the Ontological Club, and, <laughs> sniffed Miss Pratt, it was all about the encircling good. God, all is God, and God is all, quoted Miss Fleura. I had never thought of such a thing, Elector. It always seemed to me God was up high, somewhere, and that he was always displeased with everything I did. But in the lecture, I found out that I was mistaken. God is so kind, so generous. If we just ask him for what we want, and then believe that we have, why, it is ours already. And you believed all that stuff, Philura Rice? And you a church member? It's in the Bible, said Miss Philura stoutly. It's true, all true. Miss Pratt was engaged in the purely rational process of putting two and two together. She arrived presently at the correct result. I begin to see, she observed with carefully veiled sarcasm, you thought you'd like some fine new clothes and a husband, so you... Oh, Elector, I'm so glad I told you. You do understand, don't you? It's so beautiful, so wonderful. Miss Pratt snorted with mingled rage and amazement. <laughs> Quite wonderful, I should remark, and so simple. But I don't see yet how you caught the parson. Miss Philura looked up swiftly. You're, you're making fun of God, she said brokenly. Oh, I wish I hadn't told you. 
Miss Pratt burst into a short, dry laugh. <laughs> I never heard of such nonsense in all my life, she cried. It's downright wicked, that's what it is. You ought to be put out of the church instead of setting up as a minister's wife. The idea of talking such stuff and actually believing it. It's in the Bible, said Miss Philura weakly. And the wind snatched the words and carried them away like dead leaves. There's nothing about silk petticoats and ostrich feathers and getting engaged in my Bible, retorted Miss Pratt, her reddened nose uplifted in chaste protest to an outraged heaven. I'm sure I don't know what Elder Trimmer and Deacon Scrimger and Miss Deaconess Buckthorn and, oh, I was going to say our pastor, does he know what you heard in that wicked club? Miss Philura was not a very astute person, but for once she couldn't help seeing the drift of Elector Pratt's remarks. Mr. Pettibone, she said firmly, is not in any way responsible for my interpretations of the Bible. Then, having reached her own corner, she parted from Miss Pratt with an air of dignity and decision, which only partly hid her real perturbation of spirit. The grey cat, Mortimer, arose from the doorstep, where he had been awaiting her return, and stretched his sinewy fur-clad limbs. His green eyes grew greedily wide as he spied the parcel in his mistress's hand. Oh no, Morty dear, said Miss Philura, it isn't meat. Then her anxious face brightened as she remembered the plump chicken the eggs and butter reposing in the kitchen cupboard. It was only yesterday, she murmured, but I was wondering, no, thinking about our dinner, Morty, and I mentioned it to God, just mentioned it, because you know, our Father knoweth that we have need of all these things. She lifted the big cat in her thin little arms. You shall have a chicken wing today, Morty she whispered in his furry ear. Mortimer purred loudly, quite as if he understood. Then it was that Miss Philura noticed the bunch of white chrysanthemums laid against the door. She lifted them, a wistful pink staining her cheeks. Nowhere except in the parsonage gardens did chrysanthemums grow in such snowy perfection. He has been here, was her unspoken thought a swift wonder crowding her regret as she remembered that it was Saturday, a day the minister always spent alone in his study. When she had arranged her flowers in water, she sat down by the table and gazed at them almost breathlessly. No one in Innisfield, not even the minister, suspected the shy, still current of poetic feeling in Miss Falura's nature. She couldn't possibly have put it into words, but something in the ivory white of the curving petals, lapped softly one above the other, hiding a heart of gold, spoke to her of herself. All summer long, while rose and hollyhock and a host of lesser blooms had flaunted gaily in the sunshine, the chrysanthemums had spread their dark foliage in an obscure corner, with no hint of bloom. But now she leaned forward and touched the flowers with her lips. They are beautiful, even if it is almost winter, she murmured. Then she opened the paper bag she had brought from the Trimmer Emporium and took out four spools of white silk thread and set them in a row before the flowers. Why shouldn't I? she asked of the surrounding silence. Then, diligently, like the woman in the parable, she searched the nooks and corners of her memory for the exact words she had heard at the ontological club. The unseeing good surrounds us on every side, she said aloud. It presses upon us, more limitless, more inexhaustible than the air we breathe. In the encircling good is already provided a lavish abundance. A lavish abundance, Miss Philura paused to take breath. 
of everything one can possibly want desire itself is god good love knocking at the door of your understanding it is impossible for you to desire anything that is not already your own yet like every other wondrous mystery in all the world this unseen abundance this all-encircling good must be sought in the right way it was a magic door requiring the magic key for its unlocking miss philura gazed at the four white spools and the white flowers so lately emerged from the unseen into exquisite visibility oh god she prayed i should like a white wedding dress white like the chrysanthemums and after a breathless little pause she added thank you god with closed eyes she beheld the as yet invisible wedding garment white with the creamy whiteness of flower petals closing softly over a heart of gold very simple it was yet rich and smooth textured like the blossoms that come just before the snow that evening when the reverend silas pettibone having conscientiously completed two discourses treating respectively of sanctification by faith and the state of the lost after death came to call upon miss philura as was his right and privilege he found that little lady deep in the task of ripping the black and purple gown um what do you intend to do with that um brocade asked mr pettibone searching successfully in a disused corner of his theological mind for a proper name for the stuff which lay in heavy folds across miss philura's lap the reverend silas pettibone had kind though very tired-looking brown eyes and the dark hair above his forehead was streaked with grey miss philura secretly considered him the very acme of masculine good looks a hint of her opinion shone in her demure face as she made answer cousin van duser sent it to me for a wedding dress do you think it pretty mr pettibone surveyed the stuff with a new interest he took a fold of it between an inexperienced finger and thumb um, it appears he said cautiously to be very durable oh yes agreed miss philura i think it will wear for a long time and it's lined with beautiful black taffeta i can make two dresses and a coat out of it hmm murmured the minister noncommittally gazing at the large black leaves on their purple background and striving in his imperfect masculine way to picture to himself the small figure of miss philura panoplied in such a vesture it was very very kind of mrs van duser to provide for the he began in somewhat laboured fashion but miss philura interrupted him do you think it is pretty she demanded her head on one side an unsuspected ghost of a dimple peeping at him from one corner of her lips does it look like me mr pettibone gazed tranquilly at miss philura he thought her very sweet and good and he was glad she was coming to live in the desolate parsonage gladder indeed than he had ever hoped to be in his bereaved life does it repeated miss philura how inquired the minister with his deep wise smile could any sort of a gown look like you he paused to survey once more mrs van duser's outworn gown so munificently bestowed upon the dearest little woman in the world then he smote his knee with a convincing gesture certainly not he said decidedly by no means it is too dark and heavy and no i don't like it he looked appealingly at miss philura what did she want him to say he wondered and had he blundered into the wrong thing i confess my opinion in matters of woman's dress is of very little value he began apologetically 
perhaps now miss philura had dropped her shining scissors in her lap do you know she said with the air of one who has just made a delightful discovery that is exactly what i thought about it i couldn't bear black and purple for a wedding dress though i dare say i shan't mind wearing it to church and ladies aid afterwards she blushed a delicious maidenly blush under his observant eyes then she leaned forward and touched his hand i want to ask you she said breathlessly do you think god is interested in clothes end of chapter two chapters three and four of miss philura's wedding gown by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three mr pettibone gazed at miss philura in puzzled silence for the space of a minute the under shepherd of the innisfield presbyterian church as mrs van duser had once called him was not blessed with a very keen sense of humour he strove unsuccessfully to imagine the theological concept of deity to which he had been taught to pray in carefully constructed sentences as interested in the black and purple brocade he shook his head then he took miss philura's toil-worn hand in his own and patted it gently do i think god is interested in clothes he repeated why really somehow or other a certain pregnant saying concerning a millstone and the deep sea flashed across his troubled mind our lord in his various discourses certainly mentioned garments oh, more than once he went on presently miss philura's blue eyes sparkled i knew you'd say so she murmured happily um, the wedding garment in the parable pursued the minister referring to his mental concordance of scripture texts the robe of state which was brought forth for the returned prodigal and um, the lilies of the field suggested miss philura timidly jesus said that even solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these she glanced sideways at the chrysanthemums which glistened in their bridal snows beneath the yellow light of the lamp true said the minister he gazed thoughtfully at the rather shabby clothes he was wearing they were his preaching clothes of three years before last mr pettibone always wore preaching clothes of different degrees of shabbiness for the very good reason that he could afford no others he even wore a very ancient and disreputable long-tailed frock-coat and black trousers dating back into obscurity when working about the garden and in the cellar he called these garments his working togs and wore them cheerfully but down deep in some half smothered bit of consciousness lurked a carnal weakness for masculine purple and fine linen he had once met an eminent boston divine clad in a worldly suit of tweeds enlivened still further by a cravat of deep red mr pettibone attired as usual in his third best preaching clothes devoted to pastoral calls and other weekday duties was conscious of an almost sinful admiration of dr bentley's spruce person though he told himself that he could never approve worldliness and the appearance of pomp and fashion in a man of god that expression a man of god had taken great hold upon silas pettibone from his youth up almost unconsciously he had pictured this ideal personage as solemnly and decorously attired in more or less rusty black of the long-tailed variety true said the minister after mentally reviewing his wardrobe filled with graded suits of ministerial cut and then he sighed solomon in all his glory must have had some splendid clothes continued miss philura taking up her scissors again to attack a long seam of the black and purple dress 
red maybe and pink and blue and and white her brown head drooped over the sombre stuff she was ripping she didn't even glance at mr pettibone's third best preaching suit and jesus said went on the hesitating sweet voice he said how much more shall he clothe you o ye of little faith added the minister finishing the quotation almost mechanically and from force of habit and that must mean that if we only had faith enough god would give us all the clothes we needed cried miss philura jubilantly well quite possibly admitted the minister prettier clothes than solomon's persisted miss philura casting a black and purple strip upon the floor because you know lilies of the field are more beautiful than silk or satin and so inferred the minister logically you don't intend to wear a dress of this material on the occasion of our marriage and he waved a rhetorical hand towards the crumpled heap to which mrs j mortimer van duser's erstwhile robe of state had become reduced miss philura looked up at him shyly he was smiling at her almost humorously oh no she said with the girlish blush he had noticed before flitting across her face and what then is the wedding garment to be pursued the minister if i am not overstepping the bounds to inquire she paused hesitated and then bent towards him almost beseechingly you don't think i'm too um too old to wear white too old repeated the minister wonderingly it was impossible to think of little miss philura as of anything which the passing years had used unkindly you are not too old he said with decision to wear any beautiful robe and you never will be elector pratt will say i am murmured miss philura with a suppressed sigh and so i'm afraid will everybody else but if you don't think so i shall love to see you in a white dress he assured her quietly it will be he added firmly entirely suitable and becoming End of chapter three chapter four out of the mouths of babes quoted the reverend silas pettibone to himself as he walked home beneath the mild radiance of the stars he was referring to miss philura a babe in christ as he scripturally termed her surely no grown man or woman of his acquaintance possessed so rare and simple a faith miss philura he told himself with a pleasant feeling of warmth about a heart chilled with loneliness and his own stern concepts of the dealings of what he was pleased to term divine providence miss philura is one woman in ten thousand and altogether lovely mr pettibone found himself thinking of miss philura's wedding gown with pardonable enthusiasm he was glad it was to be white white he told himself was the one proper garb for so fair so pure so sweet a woman angels wore white continuously he had been led to believe then quite simply and gravely even in his thoughts this good man was always simple and grave he thought of his dead wife she had been gone from him many years and a wreath of memories lay against the closed door in his heart which bore the name mary it was another life he looked back upon from this crest of the years he saw himself as he had been in those first years of his ministry and mary no he hadn't forgotten he could never forget but the road was long and very very lonely surely she would not grudge him the solace of companionship she who was safe folded behind the jasper walls of a distant paradise the parsonage gate clanged behind him deacon scrimger's dog barked vociferously from his kennel the minister pausing upon his own doorstep looked up into the sky 
sparkling with stars between the leafless branches of the elms. I hope I'm doing right, he murmured humbly. We're both alone, you know. In the bright light of morning, streaming through the windows of his study, the Reverend Silas Pettibone changed the subject of his evening discourse to the state of the saved after death. His morning sermon on sanctification by faith took on a practical turn which astonished the members of his congregation. Miss Philura, still pilloried in the singer's seat behind the pulpit, listened with a secret rapture which she was not altogether successful in hiding. She could not help hearing the stealthy rustle of Electa Pratt's taffeta petticoat beside her. It was a disapproving rustle, she felt. So was the lavish display of highly scented pocket handkerchief with which Miss Pratt chafed the tip of her reddened nose. Electa's nose always reddened when she was angry, like the wattles of a turkey. Sounds to me like Christian science, was Miss Pratt's biting comment as the two ladies descended from the choir loft. The idea of telling about a man's asking the Lord for a barrel of potatoes. You needn't tell me you haven't been trying to fill him up with the stuff you heard in Boston. It's in the Bible, said Miss Philura tremulously. Philura Rice, you know very well the word potato isn't in the Bible at all. How dare you say such a thing? Oh, I, I didn't mean potatoes. I meant faith. That's in the Bible, and it's, it, well, it's for potatoes, or anything people need. Oh, yes, and feathers, and clothes, and engagement rings, maybe, scoffed Miss Pratt, who had of late observed the glitter of a modest ring on Miss Philura's finger. Good morning, Electa. Good morning, Philura, intoned a majestic voice. Are you discussing the sermon? It will bear discussion, it seems to me. Miss Philura glanced up into the forbidding eyes of the tall, massive lady who had joined them at the foot of the stair. Good morning, Mrs. Buckthorn, she said weakly. Yes, what did you think of it? chimed in Miss Pratt. I was just telling Philura. I thought it sounded like Christian science, but of course Philura... Oh! "'I trust not!' exclaimed Mrs. Buckthorn, wagging her head, which was surmounted by a lofty structure of black and white, pinnacled by a tuft of dispirited-looking feathers. She had the air of one who successfully denies the world, the flesh, and the devil. "'Christian science, my dear Elector, is neither Christian nor scientific, as I have always said. Really!' It frightens me to hear you mention it in connection with our pastor. No, no. Mrs. Buckthorn shook her head with closed eyes. And presently she opened them with a snap. I was grieved to hear that you've been drawn away from the truth of late, Philura. Miss Philura's lips parted, but she didn't speak. Instead, she glanced reproachfully at Elector Pratt. You've been in my Sabbath school class for more than ten years, Philura, pursued Mrs. Buckthorn, and I'm sure you never learned to pray for silk petticoats from me. No, admitted Miss Philura, I never did. I've invited the minister to dinner today for the express purpose of holding holy converse on the subject of this morning's sermon, Mrs. Buckthorn said mournfully. We should not forget that there is a great gulf fixed between the church and the world. I shall pray for you, Philura. Oh, thank you, murmured Miss Philura in a small, faint voice. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, quoted Mrs. Buckthorn sourly. I fear you have not been under the rod of late, judging from what I hear. The lady closed her eyes and drew a sibilant sigh from the depths of her being. Pilgrims in this vale of tears should not indulge in pleasure, she said in a hollow voice, nor follow the foolish and fleeting fashions of worldlings. Miss Philura could not help noticing 
that mrs buckthorn's silk gown while cut after a fashion entirely unbecoming to her stout figure made undoubted concessions to the prevailing mode what do you propose to be married in inquired mrs buckthorn in a hollow tone my wedding dress is to be white said miss philura almost defiantly white echoed mrs buckthorn in an unbelieving tone oh surely not white white cried miss electa pratt oh well i declare <laughs> and then she giggled disagreeably i suppose you'll wear a veil and carry a shower bouquet miss philura reflected a moment no i think not she said calmly i shall wear chrysanthemums white ones mrs buckthorn shook her head oh, think better of it philura she advised compassionately at your time of life oh yes and marrying a widower at that shrilled miss electra my i wouldn't think of such a thing for a moment a nice drab alpaca said mrs buckthorn antiphonally trimmed with bias folds added miss pratt mrs buckthorn nodded approval bias folds are always in good taste you will be glad you took my advice later on whereat miss electa laughed aloud and mrs buckthorn looked shocked you should remember where you are my dear electa she chided philura never takes anybody's advice sniffed miss pratt i had to laugh at the very idea then she'll never do for a minister's wife was mrs buckthorn's well-founded opinion but miss philura had drawn her skirts away from the rain-washed steps and was literally fleeing from the wrath to come that afternoon when the reverend mr pettibone had with difficulty escaped from the heart-to-heart -heart conversation which followed what was known as our sabbath repast in the buckthorn family and which invariably consisted of cold roast mutton and pallid pie flanked by pickles of an exceedingly acid sort the reverend gentleman was in a particularly thoughtful frame of mind it had been borne in upon him that in marrying miss philura he was not merely securing to himself a helpmeet to companion his solitude but also and more particularly he was providing his parish with that useful indeed almost indispensable adjunct a minister's wife we've been hoping that you'd marry again mr pettibone said mrs buckthorn majestically but i confess that i was never more surprised than when i heard of your engagement to philura rice um, <laughs> murmured the minister noncommittally well if it had been electa pratt now she's such a capable person or the widow green she's very pious and could lead the female prayer meetings but philura as i told mr buckthorn you could have knocked me over with a feather this in view of mrs buckthorn's massive proportions was a forceful statement the minister showed his appreciation of it by moving uneasily in his chair and by the quick nervous gesture with which he rumpled his iron-grey hair oh really he murmured vaguely and then as mrs buckthorn still regarded him fixedly in obvious expectation of a reply he expressed himself in handsome terms as being grateful for his parishioner's kind interest in his welfare but i think you will find the future mrs pettibone quite equal to any duties which may fall to her lot he concluded forcefully mrs buckthorn hoped so with the air and manner of a person who expresses belief in the millennium it was shortly after this that the minister had taken leave of his hostess with a dignity and decision which admitted of no further conversation mrs buckthorn had indeed followed him quite to the verge of the threshold intending to express her views on the subject of the wedding but mr pettibone had taken his hat from the rack 
had put it on his head and was halfway down the front walk before the excellent lady had time to more than mention the all-important subject of Miss Philura's wedding dress, which burned for eloquent utterance. Oh, yes, um, yes, indeed, the minister had said hastily. Verbum sap, you know. Thank you very much. Goodbye. What on earth did he mean by mentioning sap? To me, I'd like to know, Mrs. Buckthorn inquired acidly of her spouse, who was, as might have been expected, a small, meek, and generally voiceless person. Sap? echoed Mr. Buckthorn, blinking pacifically at his consort. Sap? Well, now, I've heard of such a thing as a sap head. <laughs> Maybe he meant... Benjamin Buckthorn, intoned the lady. Do you suppose for a minute that any man would dare to apply such an epithet to me? Oh, no, no, Lizzie, of course not. I only started to say... But Mr. Buckthorn rarely finished what he had to say. He did not on this occasion, for usual and entirely sufficient reasons. Mr. Pettibone, by now arrived at the parsonage, did not at once apply himself to meditations suited to the further development of his evening's discourse. Instead, he walked about the ministerial domicile, gazing at all that he saw with unaccustomed eyes. His recent conversation with Miss Philura on the subject of the wedding dress, added to Mrs. Buckthorn's pungent remarks of the afternoon, had served to bring the fact of his approaching nuptials very clearly before Mr. Pettibone's mind. It had seemed a very simple and natural arrangement to the minister. Two lonely persons, living heretofore under two roofs, would henceforth dwell under one, to the great comfort and mutual advantage of the lonely persons. It was apparent, even to the minister, that to Miss Philura the change was to be a very grave one. She would be ruthlessly uprooted from the quiet nook where she had dwelt as unobserved as a violet under a leaf, and set in the full glare of a public opinion more pitiless and scorching than the fiery eye of the sun in midsummer. He wondered if Miss Philura realised this, as he was beginning to do. He wondered, too, if he would be able to shelter her from the harsh criticisms which he foresaw would fall to her lot. Could he solace her bruised spirit? Was it, in short, going to be worth while for Miss Philura? The minister was a modest man, and quite unaware as yet of the real state of Miss Philura's sentiments towards himself. So he passed a very bad quarter of an hour, during which he arraigned himself severely for a variety of misdeeds and shortcomings, chief among which was his own carnal selfishness in venturing to covet Miss Philura's affections and the solace of her companionship. Such meditations are apt to be short-lived with the most altruistic of mankind. In the end, the Reverend Silas Pettibone, by a series of logical arguments, had succeeded in convincing himself of the truth, namely, that Miss Philura needed him as much as he needed her. Also, he metaphorically snapped his fingers in the general direction of Elector Pratt, the Widow Green, and Mrs. Deaconess Buckthorn. He, Silas Pettibone, was the pastor of the Innisfield Presbyterian Church, and he meant to perform the duties of his position in the future as in the past, with unswerving fidelity, not to say painful conscientiousness. But and he smote the blotting pad on his study table with forensic force and suddenness, he was also a man, and entitled by all the primal prerogatives of his sex to select his own mate. Mentally, he defied the Ladies' Aid Society, the session of the church, the parish, and the world at large, singly and collectively. He would wed Miss Philura, and defend her peace and happiness against all comers, Having arrived at this soul-satisfying conclusion, the minister arose from his chair and again began pacing the floor. What a wonderful little woman Miss Philura was! He always called her Miss Philura in his musings, 
and how illuminating were her interpretations of scripture really he had never adequately appreciated the matter of king solomon's apparel he allowed his mind to wander vaguely among the presumably gorgeous vestments of that long defunct monarch pink she had specified and red and gold and blue undoubtedly she was right and he sighed as he recalled the many well-worn long-tailed frock coats which constituted his own wardrobe then quite naturally it would seem he began to take dubious note of the condition of the room in which he had passed so many studious hours it was come to look at it in the strong afternoon light an exceedingly shabby place the wallpaper for example mr pettibone jerked the window shades to the top of the casement with an impatient hand really he murmured i didn't realize how dilapidated everything is he recalled now that jane stiles his housekeeper had drawn his attention to the roof of the back kitchen which leaked all over her clean floor every time it rained and to the lack of paint on the kitchen cupboards he had mentioned the subject of necessary repairs on the parsonage to elder trimmer the president of the board of trustees and had been told that lack of funds would prevent any expenditures of the sort he had told jane stiles of this adverse decision and she had sniffed a comprehensive disbelief i guess they'll find their parsonage a tumbling about their ears if they leave it be long enough was her unasked opinion mr pettibone making a leisurely survey of the ministerial residence on this occasion was forced to concur in miss stiles verdict the parsonage needed fresh paint paper and plenishings mr pettibone recalled once more miss philura's unquestioning faith in the all-encircling good mr pettibone's god while not far off had never appeared to him to be closer than breathing and nearer than hands or feet he thought of his god habitually as inhabiting eternity which he conceived to be a state very far removed from earthly life it had appeared a species of irreligion to acquaint this exalted deity with any of the sordid details of one's pilgrimage through a veil of tears the state of one's individual soul and the souls of the parish had lain heavily on mr pettibone's heart so had the condition of the heathen in foreign lands he frequently besought his god with eloquence and fervour in behalf of the president of the united states and for all legislative bodies now convened but it had not heretofore occurred to him to mention before what he habitually alluded to as the throne of grace the arrears in his salary his pressing need of a new preaching suit or the dilapidated condition of the parsonage he dropped into his study chair and opened his bible ye have not because ye ask not stared at him accusingly from the page End of chapter 4「Of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown » by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. George Trimmer, known on weekdays and in secular circles as the proprietor of Trimmer's Dry Goods Emporium, and on Sundays and prayer meeting evenings as our good brother Elder Trimmer, was actively engaged in the Emporium on the Monday morning immediately ensuing. The business being ordinarily small, since most of the Innisfield ladies, after the immemorial custom of suburbanites, did their shopping in Boston, Mr. Trimmer employed but one assistant, except at the holiday season, when the trade became brisker. In view of what Mr. Trimmer characterised as the Christmas rush, he had engaged and was now duly instructing a new clerk. This young man had come from Boston, bringing excellent testimonials as to his general good character and ability. He was a very personable young fellow, and his alert good looks were set off by a smart business suit. He had said that his name was Milton Gregory. This Mr. Trimmer promptly shortened to Milt, as being a more convenient form of address, as well as marking the subordinate position of the fashionably dressed young man. 
Mr. Trimmer was of two minds regarding his clerk. His general get-up put his employer's baggy old clothes to the blush, if such an expression may be applied to the worn and ancient garb affected by Mr. Trimmer on weekdays. On the other hand, the smart young man would advertise his business and attract trade. There would be a general desire on the part of the young women of Innisfield to buy a yard of ribbon or a skein of broidery silk, Mr. Trimmer shrewdly opined. But he intended, as he told himself, to put the dude's nose right down on the grindstone, and he was busy with this attractive programme when the door of the shop opened and the Reverend Mr. Pettibone came in. The preliminary greetings over, Mr. Pettibone entered at once upon the business which had brought him to the Trimmer Emporium. He first purchased three pairs of black cotton socks with white feet, and a washable cravat of the sort he always wore. While Mr. Trimmer was wrapping up these purchases with his customary show of goodwill, which, after all, costs nothing and often helps trade, Mr. Pettibone cleared his throat rather nervously. Um, I, uh, I wanted to have a word with you, Brother Trimmer, he began. Certainly, certainly, permitted Brother Trimmer, but his mouth tightened. You may recall that I spoke to you some weeks ago, um, with regard to necessary repairs upon the parsonage? Mm, murmured Mr. Trimmer, and I told you, you said, as treasurer of the board of trustees, that there were no funds. Exactly, smiled Mr. Trimmer. No funds. He shook his head. Sorry, but can't be helped, you know. That's precisely what I wish to inquire into. As you are aware, my salary is behind, and the arrears increase rather than diminish each year. There is now something like five hundred dollars owing to me. Oh, my, my, I hope not, deprecated Mr. Trimmer, looking past the minister out of the window. Five hundred dollars sounds pretty big, eh? It does to me, admitted the minister ruefully. I haven't urged the matter, because I've been quite alone in the world, and my expenses are not large. But, Mr. Trimmer coughed deprecatingly. A thrifty wife is from the Lord, he misquoted. She'll save you quite a bit of money in the long run. Miss Filiora's economical. She's had to be. The minister stiffened slightly. It was not to discuss my future household affairs that I came to see you, he said. Though I shall not attempt to deny that in view of my approaching marriage, I must insist upon having all arrears of salary paid in full. And as for the parsonage... Let me urge you the advisability of appointing a committee to look the property over. It is certainly false economy to permit the house to fall into complete ruin for lack of proper and necessary repairs. The minister spoke with warmth. Brother Trimmer opposed his pastor's eager look and gesture with a stony calm. Insist, he inquired with uplifted brows. I believe you said... I did say insist, and why not? Don't you insist when people owe you money which they can but won't pay? Mr. Trimmer was secretly astonished by the vehemence of the minister's tone. Moreover, he considered heat and temper entirely unbecoming in a man of God, such as he conceived the Reverend Silas Pettibone to be. A minister of the gospel, he said sourly, will hardly apply the hard and fast rules of the business world to the stipend he receives as a free will offering from the church but my salary isn't a free will offering contradicted mr pettibone it is a regular stated amount offered by the church and accepted by myself when i became the pastor of this church do you think you can collect the amount due to me by saturday evening Elder Trimmer could hardly believe his ears. He shook his head with a sniff of derision. <clears throat> Can't be done, he said, with more sharpness than he was in the habit of using towards his cash customers. No, indeed. Sorry, but it's impossible. With God, all things are possible, quoted the minister, with just a shade of significant emphasis on the introductory preposition. 
Mr. Trimmer shifted from his left foot to his right and then back again. He was growing impatient. But not with man, he said dryly. We ain't got the money. And that's all there is about it. But his eyes avoided the minister's gaze. Won't you try to get it? You mean collect, eh? <laughs> Couldn't do it, no, sir. Not at this season of the year. Christmas, you know. Folks won't pay up back pew rents at Christmas. You couldn't expect it. The minister slowly drew on his gloves and reached for his parcel. I've been to see Deacon Scrimger, he observed mildly. Mr. Trimmer tightened his tight smile. <laughs> I guess he didn't tell you nothing different. No, and he said furthermore that if any effort was made to collect pledges and pew rents, people would go to the Methodist church rather than pay up. Hmm, I guess that's straight goods, agreed Mr. Trimmer appropriately. I also interviewed some of the ladies of the congregation, Mrs. Buckthorn and Miss Day, and, ah, and what did they say? Oh, they agreed with you in thinking the Christmas season a bad one for attempting to make any collections. Mrs. Buckthorn proposed giving a donation party at the parsonage the Friday following the week of prayer. Mm, well, that might be done, approved Mr. Trimmer. Brings the young folks together. Provides a pleasant social occasion. I'll vote for that. But I won't, said the minister decidedly. I don't approve of donations. I refuse absolutely. And I told the ladies so. Well, then, I, I guess it is evident to me, the minister went on, ignoring Mr. Trimmer's obvious conclusion, that this church is in a very bad way. A very bad way. It is in an insolvent condition, and its leading members and officers refuse to take proper steps to pay their honest debts. This I consider even more alarming than the debt itself. I shall take steps... Uh, what? interjected Mr. Trimmer. I blame myself for permitting the Lord's business to fall into such confusion, continued the minister earnestly. I even conceived that I was doing you all a kindness in permitting my salary to go unpaid. I had thought of cancelling the debt, and thus contributing, to be exact, the sum of $497.50 toward my own support. Well, if you do that, maybe we could manage to paper the parlour and fix the kitchen roof, suggested Mr. Trimmer. We should appreciate it very much. Yes, indeed. But I'm not going to do it, the minister spoke sternly. The Lord has shown me my duty. Unless half the amount due me is paid to me by Saturday night of this week, I shall be compelled to lay the matter before presbytery. I shall also ask you to read a full report on Sunday, and immediately thereafter call a special meeting for prayer. Ye have not, because ye ask not. This church must humble itself before God. It must beg forgiveness for its shortcomings. It must pay its debts. Elder Trimmer's jaw fell. Wait till the week of prayer, he begged. It would, it would hurt business. It would indeed, just at the Christmas season. Man, man, cried the minister. Have you forgotten what we celebrate at the Christmas season? Then abruptly he turned and went out. Mr. Trimmer, roused from a state bordering on stupefaction, to find his newly engaged clerk at his elbow. Oh, say, but he's a armour, exclaimed the young man. You'll have to get busy, Mr. Trimmer, or he'll show you up in great shape. If you don't mind, I'd like to subscribe my first month's salary to the fund. You ain't earned it yet, snapped Mr. Trimmer, and there ain't no fund. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown》by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Malvina Bennett paused in the act of sweeping her front stoop to look about her. Miss Bennett's moments in the open air were few, 
because she was nearly always bending over her sewing near the draughty little window of the front room upstairs a damp snow had fallen during the night clinging wherever it touched so that the world at which miss bennett gazed with faded lacklustre eyes was curiously transformed every tree and bush appeared loaded with white blossoms and a pink sun struggling through a veil of light grey clouds shone faint and marvellous between the snowy branches my murmured miss bennett it certainly is handsome then she pulled the little knitted shawl closer about her head and shoulders and resumed her sweeping a pile of unfinished garments awaited her busy needle and she must not waste time in gazing at the winter miracle as she was bestowing a final flap upon the broom preparatory to entering the house she saw a small figure coming towards her across the vacant lot the pink sun had climbed higher by now and the tall jewelled weeds on each side of the narrow deep trodden path blazed with sudden splendour of blue and scarlet and fiery rose i thought was you philura said miss bennett as the hurrying figure drew near my eyesight's getting so poor lately i can't hardly see anybody at a distance i want to look over your fashion books malvina miss philura said and see if i can get some ideas i got all the december magazines miss bennett told her eagerly come right in and i'll get em all out for you as they went upstairs together miss bennett said i guess you've heard me speak of my sister-in-law's niece genevieve parsons her folks live in boston she's a sweet pretty girl and a real neat sewer she's staying with me for a while she threw open the door of the sewing-room and miss philura saw a young girl seated by the window her blonde head drooped over the unfinished garment in her lap for goodness sake genevieve ejaculated miss bennett you ain't trying to put them milliners fold on that waist of miss day's are you i wouldn't dare to trust the angel gabriel with them folds and miss day that fussy and particular thus rebuked the girl meekly yielded the black waist i thought you said i was to do it there was a dreary note in her young voice miss philura noticed that the girl's eyelids were slightly reddened as if from recent tears but she smiled pleasantly when miss bennett made them acquainted miss philura is going to marry the minister explained miss bennett briskly and she wants to look over the fashion books the girl glanced at miss philura from under her long lashes there was a naive curiosity and wonderment in her brown eyes why she was asking herself with a kind of youthful arrogance should any one so small and faded as miss philura care about fashions and how extraordinary to think she was going to be married the girl sighed deeply she was tall and held herself stiffly as if not quite over her surprise at finding her lovely head so far above her mother's here jenny you can sew the hooks and eyes on this waist said miss bennett cheerfully or if you're feeling tired certain you can go down and feed the hens there's a plate of scrapings on the kitchen table the girl went slowly out of the room her head with its heavy plaits of pale brown hair drooped a little to one side miss philura looked up from the picture of a preposterously long-limbed lady clad in a bewildering gown of black and purple i've got some silk in these shades she said rather vaguely then she added abruptly is she sick who genevieve oh no she ain't sick but i don't know but what she will be if she keeps worrying i'm keeping her busy and that i ought to take her mind off if anything will take her mind off repeated miss philura gazing at the simpering countenance of the lady in the picture who looked as if she never had any mind to take off or put on genevieve's been crossed in love said miss bennett in a sibilant whisper i don't mind telling you philura but don't for goodness sake let anybody else know she's related to the peabodies and the winthrops on her pa's side he's been dead since she was little but i can tell you she's just as proud as anybody and when his folks objected why she made up her mind she wouldn't marry him not if he was a duke and asking her on his bended knee so she come here to me miss bennett paused to listen her head on one side 
he don't know where she is she finished triumphantly i tell you she's got spunk then the two looked at each other guiltily at the sound of her light step on the stair now this here style would be real becoming to you philura miss bennett was saying when genevieve came in and it's so narrow and skimpy it don't take no goods to speak of oh i've got plenty of goods miss philura said but she couldn't for the life of her help a compassionate glance in the direction of the girl i've got a real stylish skirt pattern pursued the dressmaker you can take it just as well as not certain tain't no work at all i'll pin it on to you and see how much it'll want taken in oh, thank you malvina miss philura said gratefully but she was thinking with almost painful sympathy of the tall pale girl who by this time was sewing hooks and eyes down the back of a maroon coloured waist of ample proportions don't put em more than half an inch apart jenny cautioned miss bennett with her mouth full of pins that's miss buckthorn's waist and she's so fleshy you'd have to be extra careful with plackets and openings of all sorts for all that she's so holy she's awful hard to suit i most died over the set of that waist she wanted to look slim like the picture miss buckthorn i says the lord didn't make you up that way and she told me i wasn't to take the name of the lord my god in vain we're frail children of dust she says reproving like frail i says and i teed right out and genevieve she laughed too but miss buckthorn said she'd pray for me she always says that when she wants to set down hard on anybody i will say it takes a tuck right out of me every time there's something about the idea goes against the grain and yet i don't suppose it'd do any real harm miss bennett stood up to observe miss philura's small person invested with the brown paper pattern there she exclaimed that would be real pretty on you if you was only a mite taller now but as i told miss buckthorn we can't be thinking to change one cubit now i'll just trace off that pattern won't take a minute when the two women went downstairs genevieve parsons let two big tears splash on the front of miss buckthorn's maroon coloured waist her young heart was in a tumult of rebellion against the dull pattern of her life how she hated the jargon of the dressmaking shop pins pipings patterns and plackets the everlasting taking in and letting out the painful strivings after beauty by the hopelessly ugly the small mean economies the endless monotony of the narrow treadmill between the sewing machine and the chair by the window her mother an excellent but wholly unimaginative person had chosen genevieve's career for her when she was a little girl sewing dolls frocks she was to take a course in dressmaking when she had graduated from the high school they were poor and the girl had always thought of herself as earning money she had even looked forward to the time when she could have a shop of her own this had been the pinnacle of mrs parson's ambition for her and the girl had accepted it without question then she had met him and everything was changed all had been just as her mother had planned it up to that point Genevieve had graduated in a white muslin gown of her own making. Then she had gone to the art school and learned dressmaking in a course of twenty lessons. After that, she sewed for Miss Popham, who sometimes went out by the day with an assistant to make gowns for people who imported their best things from Paris. This was an exceptional opportunity Miss Popham impressed upon the girl, of whom she demanded the maximum of work at the minimum of wages but genevieve was satisfied in these great dull houses one generally worked in the third storey back room and ate a meagre lunch brought up on a tray by a supercilious maid but there were occasional glimpses to be had of the unknown world snatches of music pits of conversation even the fittings conducted by miss popham in the state bedroom below stairs where genevieve was sometimes called to assist even on these occasions when she played the part of an animated pincushion there was food for the imagination it was a rainy night in december when the psychological instant had arrived quite unexpectedly only the girl never referred to it as psychological 
She only thought of it as the first time I saw him. Miss Popham had just completed a masterly copy of a Paris gown, at a fifth of its cost, and was crawling about on the floor on her hands and knees, intent on the hang of the skirt on the majestic person of her employer. Genevieve was handing pins as usual, when the door opened and a young man came in. He had apparently just arrived from somewhere, for he carried a suitcase and umbrella. "'Hello, mother,' he said with a boyish eagerness. Then he planted a kiss on the lady's plump, florid cheek. "'Oh, my dear!' protested the matron. "'Don't you see I'm having a fitting?' "'You're always having something,' rumbled the boy. "'Last time I came home it was a reception, and the time before that... "'You had best dress for dinner,' his mother interrupted coldly. "'And pray give Rogers your bag when you come in.' The intruder turned, his ruddy good looks clouded by a frown. He muttered something under his breath, and then... Genevieve Parsons drew a sharp breath, and then it just happened that he glanced about the room and chanced to see her. It was the merest chance, of course, but it was strangely like the meeting of old friends.' She was sure she didn't know how it came about, but in less than a month he had managed to convince Genevieve's mother that he was a really nice young man. Beyond that, Mrs. Parsons, for one, was never known to go. He drank tea with them on Sunday nights and praised Mrs. Parsons' biscuit and raspberry jam, which he said was the best he ever ate. Once he invited Genevieve to go with him to a football game. She wore her prettiest clothes, which by this time had taken on an air quite Parisienne, carried a Harvard flag, and was as happy as a girl may be at the great spectacle of youth. The crowds, the shouting, and the victory for the crimson warmed her somewhat cold and timid beauty into a loveliness so striking that numbers of his college friends crowded about, eager to be introduced to the pretty Boston girl. That night... He told her that he loved her, quite simply and boyishly, and she had allowed him to kiss her. He would graduate in June, he said, and they would be married directly afterwards. Well, it was November now, and they were parted, for ever, she told herself. It was his mother, as any one but a little goose like Genevieve might have expected. She actually came to see Genevieve in her limousine, attended by a footman in buttons, and wearing one of Miss Popham's French gowns. The Parsons lived in a very small, very shabby little house, one of a long row of shabby little houses, all drearily alike, and very far removed from Beacon Street. It was quite the proper environment for the masses, since they were to be found there in such numbers. But it had not up to the present moment occurred to Genevieve Parsons that she was part of that great general division of humanity. His mother was very kind. She did not, as she might have done, reproach Genevieve. There was something so piteous, so despairing in the young face, that even the lady in the Popham French gown was touched by it. But she made her understand how impossible, how utterly, entirely, absurdly impossible it all was, she spoke of her son as that foolish boy and reproached herself for neglecting him. When Mrs. Parsons had attempted to interfere with strident protest to the effect that she guessed her Genevieve was just as good as anybody else, adding further relevant information pertaining to the Peabody and Winthrop connection, the great lady had merely stared at her through her lorgnette with a perfectly appropriate remark which appeared to cut the interview off short like a length of ribbon under a pair of sharp scissors. Thereupon she had swept out to her limousine. The door had been neatly shut by the footman in buttons, and the whole shining vision had disappeared in a cloud of East Boston dust which hung dispiritedly in the air before settling on the grimy little houses. She saw him once more to say goodbye. He had protested hotly, vainly, He'd be of age in a month. He'd marry whom he chose. His mother had no right, not a vestige of a right, to spoil his happiness. What did Genevieve care what anyone said, as long as he loved her? But the Peabody and Winthrop pride was alive and dominant in this humble descendant. It 
breaks my heart, she had sobbed. But I promised your mother that I wouldn't. You promised my mother, he cried, but you promised me first. In the end, he'd gone away, only to come again the next day and the next. Then, in despair, the girl had sworn her mother to secrecy and taken flight to Malvina Bennett's upper front room, where it appeared she must remain for uncounted years, sewing on hooks and eyes and learning to lay milliner's folds. End of chapter 6「Seven of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown » by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Below stairs, Malvina Bennett was saying good-bye to her neighbour. They had been talking for a matter of twenty minutes in the hall. Now Miss Philura had advanced as far as the front door. She laid her hand upon the knob. "'I must be going,' she said. "'I know you're very busy, Malvina.' "'Oh, yes, I be,' responded the dressmaker. Terrible busy, what with getting Miss Buckthorn's waist done. She wants to wear it to your wedding. And that reminds me, you ain't told me yet what you're going to be married in. I'm going to be married in a white dress, Malvina, Miss Philura said, and a soft radiance overspread her face as she remembered the chrysanthemums in the snow. After a pause, she added timidly, Mr. Pettibone likes white. He thinks white would be most becoming and suitable. Almost breathlessly, she waited for the dressmaker's verdict. It came without delay. Oh, I don't know as I should have thought of it first off, mused Miss Bennett. So many folks think of getting wear out of their wedding dresses afterward. But seems me, seeing most folks don't get married more than three times at the outside, as though they could afford a special dress. I know I should. I declare I'd be married in white if I was a hundred. Anyway, if it was the first time. Of course, it don't matter about his being a widower. Miss Philura turned the knob and opened the door. Um, did you get it ready made? inquired Miss Bennett in an aggrieved voice. I kind of thought maybe you'd let me make it for you. Seems we've been neighbours so many years. And you're going to marry the minister. It had been on the tip of her tongue to say that she had made the first Mrs. Pettibone shroud, but she thoughtfully forbore. Miss Philura shook her head. No, she said, I haven't bought the dress. Have you got the goods? Not yet. I have the silk thread, though, and the buttonhole twist. It's cream white. Oh, that's good. I don't like dead white, nor oyster white, neither. It looks kind of cold and dead to me. Will you let me make it, Philura? I'd admire to do it, and I won't take a cent for it. Miss Philura's eyes shone with gratitude, and a deep happiness filled her breast. The wedding dress was still in the encircling good, but she had the silk thread, and Malvina would make it. Oh, you needn't bother about findings either, pursued Miss Bennet eagerly. I've got some real handsome pasmentry with pearl beads I saved off Ma's wedding dress. It's the latest style now, and I know just the prettiest way to make the skirt. Oh, how good you are, Malvina, murmured Miss Philura, joyously adding the white pasmentry to the visible portion of the invisible wedding garment. Well, I guess I ain't forgot how good you was to me last winter when I was all crippled up with rheumatism. I'll come in the evening and help you cut out the brocade you've got. And say, wouldn't you like to have Genevieve for a day or two to help make it up? The change would do her good. Oh, well, um, I'd like it very much. Only, she wouldn't expect no pay from you. She's working for me by the month. And I'd like to get rid of her for a few days. It's awful worrying to have anybody about that's been crossed in love. You can feel it all through your bones like an east wind. Miss Philura thoughtfully closed the front door through which a keen wind had begun to draw. I must be going, she said gently. Well, good-bye, Philura. I'll send Genevieve over early tomorrow. Miss Philura was thinking about the girl as she went down the path to the front gate. 
she hoped she would talk to her about her unhappy love affair in the all-encircling good was happiness she was sure and balm for bruised spirits there is an abundance of everything she reminded herself a lavish abundance of everything for everybody she drew a deep breath of ecstasy the blood danced through her veins bringing back her youth which after all had never been lost but only softly overlaid with years like a chrysanthemum under the snow the butter woman's wagon was tied in front of miss philura's door and huldah herself confronted her as she opened the gate hm. i didn't dare leave anything on the stoop for fear of the cat said the butter woman so i clumb into the kitchen window and put the things on the table mind you eat em all tain't any too much if you expect to get any fat onto your bones by thanksgiving she gazed critically at miss philura her head on one side seem to me you're a mite fleshier than you was last time i was here anyway you ain't near so peaked looking and you've got a shine in your eyes it's because i'm so happy said miss philura truthfully everybody is so good so kind the encircling good seemed very near it shone in the bright dark eyes of the butter woman she had seen it in malvina bennett's worn face when she had offered to make the wedding dress <laughs> did you mind what i said and eat up everything i brought you the butter woman was inquiring miss philura blushed well i i only took two or three fresh eggs to old mrs davis her hens have stopped laying and a bit of the only a small piece of the chicken to the butter woman laughed a deep mellow laugh oh, of course you did she said you couldn't no more help giving things away than a bird can help singing i knew you would you'll make a first-rate minister's wife but i bet you'll never get real fat well i'm sure i hope not said miss philura fervently the butter woman was looking at her keenly tain't but two weeks to thanksgiving she said slowly i remember once oh, a long time ago her voice trailed into silence then she shook herself very much after the fashion of a big shaggy animal oh, oh kind of wintry ain't it she said loudly i like it though and my ends is laying right along i keep em warm and give em plenty to eat she started briskly forward did you ever see anything like that horse of mine joshua he can go to sleep on two legs kind of kitty cornered do you see she climbed into her wagon oh, good-bye she called out i'll be here next week miss philura went slowly into the house thinking of the butter woman she knew what it was to live alone just to live without any particular interest to enliven the dull monotony of the passing days now for her a door had opened suddenly into a wonderful garden full of bright-hued flowers that's the way it looked to miss philura she had never thought of the parsonage as an ugly old-fashioned house very much in need of fresh paint and paper nor of the minister as a middle-aged widower the parsonage was his home and she was going to live there with him she was to be permitted to love him to cook for him to mend his stockings and sew the buttons on his preaching clothes this was happiness joy and it was only two weeks from thursday she wondered if the butter woman was happy from her own warm heart she sent a great wave of love after the strong broad-shouldered figure perched on the seat of the jolting wagon already up the first steep slope of the hill behind the town the butter woman was whistling through her closed teeth as she drove onward through the fairy world which was slowly coming back to its common everyday aspect under the bright noonday there was a subdued jingle of silver in the pocket of her stout woollen dress a pound of coffee gave forth its subtle fragrance from the basket under the seat she owed nothing to anyone in the world and there was a slow growing fund in the savings bank Hulda Johnson saw other people's lives from their back doorsteps on Tuesdays and Thursdays. She never asked questions. 
nor spied curiously into the kitchens open to her decisive knock and yet her shrewd eyes saw much that the owners of the kitchen supposed to be concealed from the world she knew who would haggle with her over the price of her new laid eggs and the rolls of fresh butter it was a pleasure which huldah never denied herself to enter into heated argument with certain women who nevertheless paid the hard silver into her hard palm when the petty strife was ended huldah demanded and got more for her farm products than the village stores asked for like commodities brought from a distance it was little she knew concerning cold storage or preservatives and she cared less her eggs were always fresh her butter fragrant and her chickens plump and neatly dressed if you don't want them at my price well you don't have to have em was her final dictum perhaps hilda had grown a trifle hard and cynical during her solitary life she had reasons there were people even in innisfield who never found fault with her prices who were always ready to take what she had but they'd pay next time or could she perhaps change a twenty-dollar bill unexpectedly huldah said yes on one such occasion when the woman blushed stammered and finally said she had really forgotten but that very morning her husband had borrowed the money until evening after fifteen years of observing life from innisfield kitchen doors huldah knew her narrow world far better than the minister and quite as well as the butcher and the grocer whose knowledge of humankind is sure to become wide and deep and so huldah often whistled through her closed teeth as her patient old horse climbed the steep hill behind the town while she thought over the experiences of the morning there was always food for thought in what she had seen and heard on the whole huldah was singularly content as she turned her back upon the clustered houses where people were getting ready to be married were bringing children into the world or were dying and continually struggling to pay what life cost them it always appeared to cost cruelly even at its beginning and end when for the most part other people were obliged to pay it was lonely but peaceful up on the crest of the hill and the weather-beaten little house seemed far removed from the toil and struggle of the valley the furry and feathered creatures which furnished her livelihood lived tranquilly and died when she so decreed it without protest huldah drove into her own yard welcomed by the cackle of fowls and the joyous bark of a watchful collie she put up her horse with the usual care gave the fowls some grain and then unlocked the back door and entered the warm silent kitchen the kitchen in huldah's house was large and two windows looked towards the south there was a shining cook stove braided mats on the yellow painted floor where the sun lay in golden squares and a calla lily unfolding its first white sheath amid leaves of brilliant green on the back of the stove a brown earthenware teapot simmered in the heat huldah liked her tea brewed long and strong she poured a cup of the steaming liquid and drank it clear then she cut two thick slices of bread and a slab of cheese and sat down to warm her feet in the oven i guess she said aloud between bites of the bread and cheese that it's better as it is she had said this to herself many times before and at last she had come to believe it s'pose he'd come back she went on stroking the striped kitten that had jumped on her knee intent upon the crumbs of cheese just s'posen he had and i'd a married him i might have been dead long ago with a baby in my arms like that poor little thing they took me in to see this morning i might a who knows or i might a lived to stand by his grave with a row of hungry children at my back like mrs peter snell and i guess i wasn't made for it it's a heap easier as it is she stretched her broad muscular hands to the heat of the stove and surveyed them intently there ain't nothing i can't do for myself she said defiantly and i ain't lonesome not a mite no ma'am she arose presently shook the crumbs from her skirt poked the fire noisily 
and then tramped across the floor to the window, her heavy shoes echoing loudly in the quiet house. "'I tell you I ain't lonesome,' she muttered. "'I don't want nothing different from what it is. "'Why, Lan, I don't have no trouble compared with most folks. "'Look at em, then look at me. "'I'm strong and healthy, and I've got money laid up, "'and, and there ain't nobody to bother me.' "'Then suddenly her strong features became convulsed, "'and she beat the window sill with her fists.' Oh, Tom, Tom, she moaned. It's an awful long time, and me all alone since father died. She buried her face in her arms, and so was silent for a while, while a whining wind crept stealthily about the house, and the clock ticked solemnly from its corner. Somewhere a great way off, a cock crowed, announcing the hour of noon. It was echoed from Holder's barnyard twice thrice then all was still once more only the whining wind stole into the chimney and moaned there like an imprisoned thing in the long look behind which the butter woman in the midst of her bustling activities had paused to take she saw the self that had been and the self that might have been and then stepping softly like one in the presence of the dead she moved across the floor to where a battered chest stood against the wall. It had been painted a dull blue, and on its top, worked out in brass-headed nails, was a device of crossed anchors and a name, Thomas Bowles. She lifted the lid and looked in. Then one by one she took out the articles within and laid them on the floor beside the chest. A seaman's blouse, a huge shell pink and white like a baby's palm, other smaller shells, alive with the iridescent mystery of the sea, many-hued corals, a string of curious dark beads exhaling the odour of spices. All of these things the butter woman removed, and then, crouched beside the chest, she leaned her chin upon her rough red hands and stared down at the one thing which remained therein. It was an oblong box of shining wood, inlaid with many-coloured bits of shell in a design of flowers and leaves. It had not grown old, she was thinking. It would never grow old. For an instant she saw it as she had first seen it years before, through an aching blur of tears. Then she took it on her lap, and sitting flat on the floor, opened it. A faint odour of roses crept from the box, and stole through the room like a gentle ghost of the long ago. There were folds of tissue paper within. The woman touched them, her rough hands grown suddenly tremulous. Then she deliberately lifted the paper and gazed at what it hid for a long minute. End of chapter 7